อาจจะปิดไม้ให้คุณเบนแป๊บหนึ่งนะคะตอนนี้เสียงมันเหมือนกระตุกกระตุกลงสูงลงสูงลงสูงลงสูงลงสูงลงสูงลงเดี๋ยวการอบรมจะเริ่มตอนเก้าโมงสิบนาทีนะคะวิวิวสตาร์ทเดอะมิทติ้งแอทไนท์เชนเอ็มคุณจะมีอะไรครับคุณจะจะมีโอเคโอเคมาอ่าพี่เบนจะมี Um, the back, the back door in the in our building, in our building, we just have to lock to, to lock it. The back door. Okay. Yeah, yeah, the back door. Just um, we have problem with the
Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to TULIP online training. My name is Sita Pa. I am a librarian at Thomasat University. For today's set topic is how to answer an outfit phone in English. This topic aims to enhance English communication skill, particularly in telephone communication. You may think it's just a phone call or it's a big deal, but there are other techniques and information that you may not be aware of. Please welcome Mr. Benjamin Ibley, an expert in English language and international exchange from Thammasat University. We'll be the speaker for the session today, for the today's session. Uh, he will give you helpful tips to help you not only can talk to the telephone, but to speak with real manners. Okay, the session will begin shortly and will end at allow uh, 12 p.m. or early. Please turn off your microphone during the session. If you have any questions, why is in the chat box? And we will, we will discuss this at the end of the session. So, Kun, Mr. Benjamin, if you're ready, you can start now. ขอตายตอนตอนนี้พี่เรศฮัลโหลคุณเบนไอแคนนอตเชียร์ยูพลีสเทอร์นอนยูไมโครโฟนเฟิร์สขอบคุณมากมากคุณเป็นผู้ช่วยที่ดีมากใช่ไหมฉันสามารถช่วยได้ขอบคุณมากขอบคุณใช่เราเคยได้ยินเสียงก่อนไม่ได้อ่านคุณคาร์นเพราะเมื่อเธอพูดเราได้ยินเสียงเขาดีมากงั้นเรามาเริ่มไหม Yes. Okay. Welcome to how to answer it in a, an office phone in English. And this presentation will be in two parts. Uh, the first part is some general comments uh, uh, about the situation of answering an office telephone in Thai English. And the second part will be very specific uh, little bits of advice But both uh, the first and the second part are really just meant uh, to make people more comfortable and less anxious about uh, answering the phone in English, because um, naturally it is a stressful thing to have to speak a foreign language on the phone and in an office. Um, 
particularly because, as you know, uh, when you speak on the phone, it's just words, it's just the voice. Um, if someone comes to an office, a, a Faran, or just any foreigner, or someone who is not a Thai speaking person, and uh, tries to communicate with the people in the office, uh, the visitor can be sometimes in a bad mood because that happens, I guess. But um, mostly they can see that there's a person, a Thai person in front of them, a nice person who is trying to communicate and doing their best. And um, that uh, image of the person in front of them can reassure them and give them confidence that at least someone cares and is trying to help. Um, unfortunately, on the phone, all they have, the person who calls, is the sound of a voice. So if there are problems with understanding, it can be fairly critical. Um, and remember, I really don't have to remind you, but I'll say it anyway, um, that when someone who is a native English speaker or a speaker of any language is speaking to another native English speaker, let's say, the communication can have problems, but you assume that the communication will be fairly clear. If uh, someone who is a native English speaker is speaking to a non-native English speaker, for example, someone who speaks Thai English, it's more complicated. But when there's a non-native English speaker, like a Thai English speaker, speaking to another non-native English speaker, like someone from Bhutan or someone from Malaysia, um, that can cause all sorts of misunderstandings and complications. So the solution is, um, I would say, the first solution is really to relax and not uh, become too anxious because, and this is my one of the first statements I like to uh, give to the, um, uh, oh, this is just housekeeping. Um, or a little bit of library uh, advice. Um, for everyone here who is uh, watching or listening to the uh, seminar, um, should be aware that the library offers an English abstract editing service. Uh, and here, let's, let's see if I can go to it now. Yeah. Um, it, um, it's presented in English and in Thai. And um, it can be found by looking at the U services page of the library, or it can be found on Google search just by looking at Tamasat abstract. And the first thing that you find if you search on Google for Tamasat abstract is this link. Now, um, it has, um, it says Thomasat Abstract uh, Editing Service, but in fact, it edits any texts in English. They could be a resume. It could be a, um, a statement for uh, an application for a fellowship or for graduate school or uh, for anything where you have to write in English. Uh, can be sent in uh, to the Tamasat uh, Abstract Editing Service, and uh, it will be returned free, no cost. It will be returned within three days, three office days. And um, that could be useful to build your confidence in terms of using English, because part of a major part of answering the office phone in English is how what your attitude is about English, how you feel about English. Now, let's go back to the um, uh, to the. Let's see if I can go back to the powerpoints wherever they they might be. <laughs> they they've disappeared again. Just a yeah, moment, power, everyone. Where, where are they? Where are they on the? No, 
Oh, there they are. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. So, um, and this just describes the abstract editing service, right? Anyone with a Thomasat ID number is eligible. And uh, for more information, you can call the library or send an email. Um, one last little commercial or uh, a little bit of information, but again, to build your confidence with English is the Read Ta Ben page on Facebook. Every week, three different books, many of them free for download, um, are on the Read Ta Ben page. You can follow uh, and then download whatever the book is interesting for you because it's nice to always have a little bit of English reading. Never hurts. Even if you read a page or two, better than nothing. Uh, and it can help you feel more comfortable with English because, as you know, um, when you have the whole day in Thai language mostly and you have Thai, 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 if someone suddenly speaks to you in English, it can be a shock. It can be very upsetting. Uh, it's almost if you in the street, if you try this to talk English to another Thai person, they'll act almost as if you hit them, you know, because it really is startling to have to deal with another language. And um, back to the, uh, the PowerPoints. And again, this is just about the read cop end page and the blog. Well, we'll we'll pass by that. But that's another feature of the Tamasat University Library, the blog, very quickly. Um, talks about different events, uh, Zoom webinars uh, that are free to attend and listen to, uh, lots of different, uh, also books and other, other things that may be of interest to kind of get your English a little more familiar and it won't be such a rare experience for you or such a big shock if you have to answer the office phone in English. Um, but one thing that I wanted to mention, because quite often Thai people say to me, especially um, uh, staff or students, they say, my English, my English. Well, I always tell them, don't feel bad. Don't feel guilty. It's not your problem. It is the problem of the nation. And what we have in Thailand every year, they have something called the English Proficiency Index. This is the Bangkok Post explaining that English ranked very low in English Proficiency Index, and it is very low. Uh, every year. Uh, and what does this mean? It means that, um, oops. Let's see if I can actually find the English proficiency index. Um, English proficiency index, Thailand. Okay. Yeah, so this is the English Proficiency Index, which is measured each year. And every year, it's not very good. Out of 113 countries mentioned, Thailand is 101. Position in Asia, number 21 out of 23. That's not good. So in Asia, here's the list of English ability. Cambodia, China, Hong Kong, Indonesia, India, all the way at the bottom. We're better than Uzbekistan, and we're better than Vietnam, according to this uh, proficiency index. But other than that, we're not as good as Tajikistan and other countries. And so this is a national issue. Some might consider it a national problem or a national emergency. But I think it's very important to say this is not meaning to criticize the wonderful English language teachers who work very hard and are very dedicated and devoted each day to helping students and helping adults sometimes learn English. But what I think is it is a problem that needs more support. 
And so this type of seminar where we talk about the shock or the unpleasantness of having to answer the office phone in English, it can uh, make people feel a little more comfortable or a little happier about that challenge. Because uh, in a country where there is this issue of English usage, it means there are many brilliant people, uh, very intelligent, highly trained, educated people who have problems feeling comfortable about English. There, there could be a university rector or a dean of a faculty, people who are quite high placed, who, when they have to use English, feel not so confident. And by and large, I mean, in the people I've met, it's hard to you know generalize, but I would say that um, even very intelligent people, very accomplished, highly educated, uh, if you ask what is your least favorite subject uh, in, or least favorite academic subject, least favorite subject at school, they would probably say maybe math, mathematics or Thai uh, or English. And I think the, the English part of it can mean that the more English classes people have taken, the more nervous they are because they remember it as a personal failure as something that didn't work out, it might have been boring for them, or whatever their emotions are. Uh, so I call English uh, like a Freudian trauma. Uh, that's just my expression for English in Thailand, because there is some emotional uh, feelings that are involved. And so I think that to improve the situation, not only do we need friendly uh, seminars and workshops and coaching, uh, but we need um, maybe more research from people like behavioral therapists, speech therapists, because uh, in general in Thailand in English uh, classes do not discuss phonetics and pronunciation maybe as much as they should, psychiatrists, uh, even neurologists, because when you speak English as a Thai person, your brain has to send electrical signals to the rest of your body and your face and your, your mouth and your jaw. And you have to move your mouth in ways that you do not do when you speak Thai language, which is your natural language. So if you have to do this strange and new thing, it can be quite shocking. And the more you do it, the more you speak English, the more comfortable you are, and the less of a shock it is. So I always like to say that speaking English or any foreign language is not like uh, an intellectual exercise where you learn, uh, memorize a list of grammar or things like that. Speaking English is a physical exercise like swimming, riding a bicycle, driving a car, uh, and those type of activities where if you do it more and more, you will think less and do it more naturally. So speaking in an office phone in English, uh, the trick is really to have the words ready in your mouth, uh, not, what they call on the tip of the tongue, um, so that you can say them without too much delay. Uh, when people are... Uh, Yes, okay, go ahead. Um, when people, uh, is it okay? When people are, um, sometimes I know that, especially people who are very educated, I think of one a very smart person with very good reading comprehension, but he would, uh, he would um, listen to someone in English, this is a Thai person, and then translate in his head, into Thai, what the person had said in English, then think in Thai about what they would like to answer, and then um, translate that again into English and finally say something. Well, that took a long time. And I explained to the person, I said, if you just sit there quietly, which he tended to do uh, for a long time, people will just 
either assume you didn't hear or you did not understand, and they might walk away. On a phone, especially if you're speaking on an office phone in English, speed is, is an element. So, so the point is to have a rather rapid reaction. Um, and that is another challenge, but it has to do with being more familiar uh, with the physical activity of speaking English. Um, and in general, uh, the more, there was a very uh, intelligent uh, professor uh, of language at, at Yale University called, his name was Pierre Capretz. He was actually a teacher of French and he devised, uh, devised a French language course, but that doesn't matter because his method I think works for all languages. And he called it a total immersion, meaning like in the swimming pool, if you go under the water, you're totally surrounded by water in a swimming pool. But in language, you would have only English around you. And I think that is a very valuable thing to do. If you find you can take your moments of sanuk where you relax and you want to watch a series, choose a series in English. Or if you listen to... Uh, uh, podcasts or whatever you do for, for relaxing, do more and more English if you can, if it doesn't irritate you too much. And this will help you uh, feel less shocked uh, when you have to speak on an office phone in English because you'll be more familiar with recognizing the vocabulary. Uh, and so you'll be more ready to speak and respond if someone speaks to you. Um, anyway, moving on to the, uh, that's, so we've already talked about the English Proficiency Index. Now, so that was the first part of the situation, which is to say it is a widely shared experience to feel anxious or uncomfortable when answering the telephone in English in Thailand. It is not rare, it is not personal. So we should never feel guilty or bad or embarrassed or ashamed. I think we should try to imitate, and I think we can learn from this example. There are people, you've probably seen them, who, who work uh, in the uh, uh, food court or maybe work at the university cafeteria who have had really very little education and maybe no English at all. They never studied English, but they can speak English. At least they can speak a few words of English and sell their Coca-Cola or whatever they have to sell. And they seem to almost have a good time. They seemed amused or even entertained to speak their two or three words of English that they have. They don't feel that heavy sense of uh, worry and anxiety and concern about the problem of speaking English. Um, and so if we can imitate these people who have almost no education and think of, you know, even if we've sat for several years in English classes and still feel anxious and worried and troubled by the challenge of speaking English, if we think, well, these people who really have no uh, privileges like that have no extensive e educational experience. They're ready to almost be entertained by the idea, oh, how funny, I have to speak English now. With that attitude, and I think some educated people have that attitude, maybe not many, but some do, and they think, oh, it's, it's rather diverting or amusing to have to speak in this foreign language, and here's my version of it, you know, <laughs> I think. As long as um, we don't make the mistake of thinking that we know it all, because in, in some cases, people, well, we don't have to go into that in, at great length, but some people are a little overconfident. But as long as we recognize that it's always a learning process, I mean, I've been speaking English for many years, but I still think of myself as learning English because each day, I try to learn more about different vocabularies in different countries and literature and other things that are, I look up. So it is an ongoing process. It's life learning, as they call it. 
Um, so anyway, uh, when we answer the phone, there's a certain logic to what we say. So the first thing we want to reassure someone is that they have called the right office. So in the case of someone who works for the Thomasat University Library, we would say Thomasat University Library. Um, this says libraries because we used to call it the Thomasat University Libraries, but now we call it the Thomasat University Library, official name. And then whatever department you're in, cataloging department, uh, information department, anything you, serials, rare book department. And then this is, and your name, how may I help you? And it's very important, the how may I help you part, because if you just say your name, uh, you're not reassuring the person that you're ready to help them. And that is the key point about the whole experience um, about how to uh, answer the phone is we want to uh, reassure them that we're ready to help. And if, if we can achieve that, whatever the problems of communication may be, are not very important because we have reassured the person who called, yes, I am here and I am ready to help and I am doing my best. Again, if the person came into the office and saw you sitting there and trying to help, they would get an easier picture. Oh, this person is really trying. This person is doing his or her best. Uh, but on the phone, we have to say things like, how may I help you? Because we want to show the person who's calling that we are ready to help. We're here. We care about help. So we will move on to the next slide and what to say. So again, um, if you're in the, for example, if you're in the department of the director or vice director, you say, Thomasat University Library, Office of the Director or Vice Director. This is, and your name speaking, again, how may I help you? Uh, this is your name speaking. That's who you're speaking to. And the person who's on the other end of the phone will get the information, first of all, that they've called the right office or they've been transferred to the right place, the library, and to the right uh, specific office in the library, the office of the director or vice director, whoever they wanted to speak to, and then the name of the person who is taking the call, which is, again, very important because the worst is when someone says, well, I spoke to someone, but I don't know who it was, or I don't remember their name, or I didn't understand their name. So when you say your name, you're actually making it possible for the person to then follow up if they wish to. They might say, oh, there was that nice and helpful person, you know, your name. And I need to ask another question. Can I ask for that person, please, again, because we already spoke about something before. And can, can I speak to that person again? So if they know your name, they know who to ask for. They know who to speak to. And then you will have already dealt with the issue and spoken about it. So you will have some idea about what it's all about. They will not have to say it all over again to a new person. Um, again, how may I help you? Reminding them that you're there to help. All very important. So you said uh, two sentences and you, you communicated a lot about what, um, about what you... Uh, Let's see. Right. So um, next. Now, when you say you identify yourself and you say what office you work in, and, and when you say your name on the phone, which is different from when you meet someone in person, because on the phone, remember, it's always more difficult to communicate names, things like that. Things have to be spelled, spelled out, you know. So if you can, and whether it's a nickname or something else, give a brief and easy to remember version of your name. 
And that means easy to remember for international people who do not know Thai names. Many very famous Thai names are completely unfamiliar to international people. They've never heard that name. They don't recognize it as a name. They don't know it's a name. So if you can give them a name that they can easily understand and recognize and you can spell with very few letters, that helps because again, they will know who they're talking to. They will know who to ask for if they want more information. So if you can be uh, very easy and often in English and speaking on the phone, uh, uh, on the office phone in English, but also speaking English in other professional contexts, um, just doing the easy thing is often the best because it, it helps, it's, it uh, gets things working more readily. If you try to be very formal and very official, uh, it can take a long time and a lot of people won't understand. So better to be easy and choose the shortest name and the, the one that people will understand. They don't really need to know, usually. They don't need to know uh, your full name unless they ask for it. Uh, they might need it for their form or whatever it is they're, they're filling out. But unless they ask for your full name, because as you know, especially for international people, um, uh, Thai names can be a little long. You know, for Chinese people, who, a name might be Ming Cho Li or something like that, whereas a Thai name could go on for several syllables. Probably the person calling doesn't need to know your full name first and last unless they ask for it. If they need it, they will tell you. So try to give them a brief and easy to remember version of your name. Now, when you speak into the phone, this is sometimes you see this on the bus or people who are not familiar with, I think you see it less and less, but in the days when people were still getting used to speaking on cell phones, uh, some people are disturbed, older people, sometimes even younger people though, um, with the fact that there is no microphone that delivers the sound of your own voice in the cell phone to the, per the ear of the person who's talking. So the person who's talking doesn't have the reassuring uh, quality of in the old uh, landline phones, when you would pick up the phone and you talk, you would hear your own voice uh, through a microphone amplified in your ear. So you would be reassured, oh, um, someone can hear me, I'm speaking loud enough. And of course, if you wear earphones, then you, you will get that sense. But uh, on a uh, cell phone or many other types of uh, microphones, you don't get the sound of your own voice. So you have to measure it yourself and you have to then have some faith that the sound of your voice will be communicating. So to do that, you want to speak directly into the mouthpiece. You want to make sure that you're speaking directly and not to one side like that, because sometimes the, the sound may not be picked up the way you might want to. By the way, before we go any further, I would like to just suggest that anyone who has a question of any kind, please feel free to ask. We don't have to wait till the end. Feel free to interrupt and you know, there's no problem here. Just interrupt and ask whatever you'd like to ask uh, if you have a question and then we'll take the questions and then go on with the presentation. Uh, this is meant to be an informal coaching and it is not the type of you know strict uh, lesson plan so if anyone, does anyone have a question yet? Uh, no, not yet. Okay. Well, if, if you do, please just let us know and uh, we will then deal with it. All right. Now, um, setting your ringtone. This, these are all very subtle details. 
but they do have something to do with the with the image you project on the office phone when you're speaking English. If someone calls an office, was that? Uh, I don't know who that was. I think no. it's accidentally. That was an accident. Okay. Yeah, no, yeah. At my pen at all. So if um, someone calls an office, uh, they expect a certain, uh, shall we say, um, serious, uh, serious response. It doesn't have to be sort of life or death, so grim and so anxious and so sad, which sometimes, you know, if speaking English is already difficult and unpleasant, having extra pressure can make it absolutely miserable. So I don't want to suggest that it should be that serious, you know, or that humorless. Um, if we keep in mind the people working in the, in the food court who have uh, fun speaking English, keep, keep that in mind because they also do sell their Coca-Cola. They're serious about selling their Coca-Cola, but they have, they, 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 they have a little bit of delight in doing so. So similarly, if the ringtones in the office phone when you're speaking English, if the telephone is right in front of you on the desk, you don't have to have very loud ringing. That's also to be polite to the people who are, uh, who are working with you in the office. You don't want to shock them each time the phone rings. Um, you could set it at medium, you know, and I'm sure, I'm sure you'll hear it if it rings. But... Um, this is another rather subtle point, but it may make a, a difference. If you use the cell phone for the office, as many people do, better not to have the ringtone too informal. So don't put like a song by Beyonce or something like that. Choose a more formal sounding ringtone. So the person calling will get a sense that it's an office. It's a serious place. It's a place where people are serious because again you want to give them the impression that you will and you care about you know what they're asking and you will give a serious and um, um, a serious kind of response to their request so let's see um, again uh, this is just a question of being polite and pleasant and have good manners but Think about how loud you are, because uh, there is, of course, in the mouthpiece, uh, an amplifier, which makes the voice louder for the person listening. So it's not necessary to yell. Even if there's noise around you in the office, probably your voice will be picked up by the microphone and the person hearing you will hear you or they'll tell you if they can't hear you because of the background noise. But most of the time, if you speak clearly enough, they will understand you. And that's what matters. Um, so it's not necessary to yell. Because if you yell uh, when you're speaking on an office phone in English, you can uh, uh, sometimes, you know, give someone a headache or something. It would be unpleasant. So you want to make a nice impression. Um and again, this is just a general general advice uh, for what's called multitasking. If you're busy with the computer, but you also have to answer lots of phone calls or some phone calls, you may want to wear a headset because that will free up your hands and you won't have to hold the phone to your ear. You'll have it all right there and you'll have the mouthpiece as well. It's up to you and you you will know best based on how many phone calls you need to take during an office day, uh, how much computer work you're busy with uh, and other aspects which really have to do with how your work day uh, goes. And you, again, if you make yourself comfortable and you do what is easiest for yourself, you will communicate that sense of being uh, relaxed and at, at ease you'll communicate that to whoever calls. And that gives you a more confident uh, feeling, a more confident air. So next, speaking clearly. Important not to eat 
or chew gum when answering the phone. Sometimes it's difficult because someone might call during lunchtime or during a snack time or when you're eating or chewing gum, but better not to have that uh, as an obstacle because as we've talked about, already it can be uh, challenging to communicate what you want to communicate on the phone with someone who has international uh, speaker of English, maybe not a native speaker of English, uh, someone who uh, will have difficulty understanding. And so if you're speaking with your mouth full, it just makes it all the more, 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 you know, you don't want to give that impression. You want to speak clearly, as clearly as possible. And so when you answer the office phone in English, just try not to be eating anything or chewing gum. Um, now there's the question, which is, a, again, a more subtle point, but if you're sitting there in the office and someone calls, and then suddenly someone comes in, and it was, so who do you deal with first? Do you deal with the person on the phone, or do you deal with the person who's a visitor? Um, sometimes, and again, it depends on the case, sometimes... Uh, you may decide if it seems like a less urgent phone call, uh, you may decide to ask the caller if you may put them on hold for a moment. May I put you on hold for a moment? And be ready if you say, may I put you on hold for a moment? They may say, no, I can't. I am, you know, I have to get an answer right now. So for them, it's urgent. Uh, but if they don't mind being put on hold, if it doesn't make them angry or upset or if it doesn't sound like they care, then you may want to do that just to clear up whatever the situation is with the person who is actually physically in front of you. Because again, the impression that you make, whether it's on a visitor who's, um, who has actually come to the office or whether it's your... Um, caller, the person who has phoned the office, uh, you want to then give the best impression to both people, if possible, because um, it can be frustrating if someone comes to the office and goes through the traffic of Bangkok and gets to the office and stands in front of you, and then you talk a long time on the phone, it almost seems because they don't know what you're talking about. Um, it may seem like uh, they have to wait and then they don't like waiting. And so you don't want to have the person who is in front of you be unhappy, just like you don't want the person on the phone to be unhappy. So you have to try to balance who is likely to be unhappy first if you have to deal with both of them. Uh, but quite often, um, if you put the person who called on, on hold, and then you uh, deal with the person who is right in front of you, that may be the best solution. Again, this just says the visitor usually has priority, namely, if, oh, if you, oh, oh dear. this is a very funny microphone. Um, it's okay, Goodman, thank you, but it's, uh, um, the visitor usually has priority. Uh, it means visitor first. They came physically to the office. They're here. Perhaps they're here to see someone important. You don't know until you find out what they're there for. So you want the person who is physically there to feel that they're being taken care of and whatever they need is given to them first because then they can go and see whoever they have to see. So the fact is the person on the phone relatively speaking, is in a comfortable situation, usually. Maybe not, but it's usually the person on the phone can wait a few seconds and it seems less uh, dramatic or less urgent. Um, again, because the person who has come to the office, who has come to the desk where you sit, they are there in person, they made an effort, an extra effort to be present at the office. So we show them the politeness and the courtesy of dealing with their question first. Um, and that's just a general rule. There are exceptions. Uh, and uh, again, you have to sort of 
do what you think is best in many of these cases because every situation is different. In some cases, you might want to first deal with the with the phone if it seems urgent or extremely important. Uh, again, ex exception to the rule, where you deal with the caller first. If the caller is a very important person, probably best to deal with the phone call first before the other person, assuming the other person is not a very important person. So use your judgment. Do whatever you think is best at the time, you know. Mr. Benjamin, <laughs> uh, there's a question in the chat yes. box. What to say if you need to put someone on hold? Also, if we need to put on hold for quite a long time, what should we say? Right. Well, <laughs> uh, well, I think in, in a previous, and I think let me go back to it in case that would help. Um, yeah, this is. May I put you on hold for a moment? May I put you on hold for a moment? Is the thing to say. Um, if it's going to be more than a moment and you know in advance it's more than a moment, which you don't always know, sometimes when you put them on hold, you think it's going to be just for a moment, but it turns out to be several minutes. So if you say, may I put you on hold for a moment? If you think, okay, uh, it's gonna be a longer than a moment, you could say, may I put you on hold for a moment? It may, may take some time if you can wait. It may take some time if you can wait. Now, if they can't wait, uh, they may prefer to call back. And I have some other PowerPoints about calling back and how to suggest to call back and all those others. However, the other possibility is if you uh, say, may I put you on hold for a moment? And then you find out, oh, the person I was hoping to transfer them to maybe won't be free for another five or 10 minutes. So the person who you have on hold, assuming that they, that they are still on hold and that they haven't gone away, if you can go get back to them on the line, you say, hello, it is me again, say your name, so that they don't think that they're speaking to whoever they were hoping to speak to. But you say, hello, it's me again, um, and your name. Um, I'm afraid this may take longer than expected. Uh, would you like to continue holding or would you prefer to call back? Uh, it always give them the choice because, you know, it depends, they know how urgent their request is. And if, you know, we treat them like intelligent people and we give them a choice, then they appreciate that. Uh, the problem with a lot of the automatic systems, the phone systems, is they don't really give you a choice. They just keep you on hold forever. They call it infinite hold. And people at call centers, I'm sure you've had the experience of being in the call center waiting for a half hour or more uh, just to get to a live person. Very frustrating. People hate that. You know, customers are always complaining about that. So you don't want to bother them too much if they're on hold. You don't have to talk to them each five minutes. You just tell them, may I put you on hold? You put them on hold. But if it turns out that the person who they wanted to speak to is not available for five or 10 minutes, you can then say, go back to the line and remember to say your name because the first thing they will think when they hear a live voice is, oh, that's the person I wanted to talk to. How are you? You know, no, it's just me again. So you're disappointing them. You're telling them, no, it's just the, the person who answered the phone the first time <laughs> telling you more information. Uh, it's me again. Uh, I found out that the person you wanted to speak to is not available for another five or 10 minutes. Would you prefer to call back? Would it be easier to call back? Or do you wish to continue to hold? And whatever they prefer, you know, give them a choice. Oh, dear, this microphone is an adventure. It's okay, it's, it's all right. So um, they say, if they say, uh, you know, would you prefer to call back? Uh, 
then they feel like they have some power in the situation and that and that they're what they prefer is a matter of interest for us. In other words, we care about what they prefer and we want to give them the choice of saying what they would like. And people call and actually appreciate being getting that impression that we uh, care about them. We want to know what they would like. And uh, so we uh, want to hear whether they wish to stay on the line, whether they wish to hold, continue to hold, or whether they would like to call back. Up to them. Free choice. They like that. All right. Were there any other questions at the moment? Or no? That's okay. No? That was it? Okay. Next PowerPoint. Um, putting them on hold. Right. Now, when you put someone on hold, be sure that they really are on hold if you can, you know, make verify because you want to be sure that they're on hold and that you didn't hang up by mistake. Because that sometimes happens, even if you don't mean to, sometimes it doesn't work. Just like transfers, phone transfers do not work 100% of the time. Sometimes it just doesn't work. And also, you don't want the person who called to be able to hear what you're saying in the office. You want to make sure that they're just off in their own little world of being on hold and that they're not listening to whatever, not that, you know, not that you're saying anything terrible and you're probably talking in Thai language anyway, so they probably don't understand it, but still for a professional uh, impression and a professional atmosphere in an office, when you answer the phone in English, you don't want uh, to give uh, all of that background noise where people start talking and laughing or eating or whatever else they're doing in the office. Um, you want the person who was on hold to really be on hold and off in their own little room somewhere in their own little private area uh, where they don't do not hear the office noise. That's really the classical uh, on hold experience. You're in your own little uh, cocoon, you know. Now, let's see. When to answer the phone? Well, ideally, and especially cell phones, which tend to keep ringing, you know, they ring and they ring and they ring. But ideally, uh, we should answer quickly. Because in the office, phones should generally be answered after two or three rings. Now, as you know, uh, when phone uh, office phones are automated uh, to play recordings and take messages, they tend to pick up automatically after two or maybe three rings, sometimes just two rings. And so people have the habit, especially international people, of when they call an office, they expect uh, someone will answer after two rings. That may not always be realistic. You know, a library, for example, is not the same as other kinds of offices. And some offices may not respond that quickly after two rings. It may take a while for someone to answer. That just has, happens to be the nature of the office. But the ideal is after two rings or maybe three, it's polite, considered courteous and efficient. We want to seem like we're efficient uh, to answer the phone at that point and not wait too long. Because otherwise people may wonder, you know, is the office closed? Uh, should I call another day? Uh, is the phone working? Because sometimes, you know, when, when you call a phone and it just rings and rings, sometimes that phone just doesn't work or some, there's some problem on the line. You don't know. So the person who's calling doesn't have the information about why someone is not picking up the phone. Uh, so anyway, we will move on. Uh, what to say when you pick up the phone? Now, some people recommend saying good morning and good afternoon, particularly British. 
But this is not a good idea because, you know, when you sit in the office all day, it's easy to forget, well, is it still the morning or what time is it? Is it 11.59 or is it 12 o'clock noon? Is it afternoon now? You don't have to worry about all that and maybe make the mistake, which some people do, good morning, and then you realize, oh no, it's the afternoon. Uh, or good afternoon, and it's not yet the afternoon, it's still the morning. So better to just say, hello, hello, <laughs> and don't. And don't do the good morning or good afternoon. It's not worth the bother. This is, again, as, uh, just to make life s as simple as possible. When you speak uh, on the office phone in English, if you can narrow down the possibilities that make your life easier, you will have a better time and less anxious time, more comfortable time uh, when you speak English on the office phone. If you just do what is natural and easy, so hello, hello, and then as we said in the beginning, when you when you answer, let's go back to the uh, and you say hello, Thomas at University Library Department. This is your name speaking. How may I help you? Hello, hello. And uh, that really is the best. And I would just forget about good morning and good afternoon. Um, we'll go back to the, uh, hello. And then again, the department you work in, maybe the person you work for, depending on who you work with and your name. Now, Again, this is a, just a reminder, since someone was particularly interested in putting people on hold, uh, before you do it, always ask, do you mind holding or may I put you on hold? Most people will not mind. If they do mind, maybe they have a real reason for not, for, for not wanting to be put on hold, uh, they will tell you. But when you ask them politely, do you mind holding? May I put you on hold? Uh, that, again, uh, gives them a certain uh, power in the conversation uh, and makes them feel like you care about whether they're happy or not. Um, but most people will not mind being put on hold as long as they have the impression that something will be done to answer their uh, questions or their uh, solve their problem, whatever the reason is that they are calling for. Now, um, what to call the person who is called. Now, Thailand is a, is a polite country where people are kun this and kun that, you know. And um, when you take the name of the caller, better not to call them by the first name. Uh, because in an office situation, when you're speaking English, it's always better to be more polite than less polite, because you don't want to give the impression of being not polite enough, not courteous enough. So even if the person seems very friendly and very, you know, unless you, I mean, if you know them, obviously it's different, but most of the time it will be someone you don't know. So you don't want to be too informal with someone you don't know. Uh, and you should call them Mr. or Ms. or Professor or Doctor, whatever their name is. Uh, and use that name and use the, uh, the, the Mr. or Ms. or Professor or Doctor rather than just calling them by their first name. Because again, if you say their first name, it seems like you're very familiar, like you're an old friend of theirs. And especially if they don't know who you are and you don't really know who they are, it's not appropriate in some situations uh, to be quite that friendly. You want to seem pleasant and friendly, but not too friendly. That's the point. So stick with the Mr. or Ms. or Professor or Doctor. Now, if they say they cannot wait, and they say, I do mind if you, if you put me on hold, I can't wait. Then um, you can ask, can I take a message and have someone call you back? 
can I take a message and have someone call back? Or would you like to call back at, and then you give them the time that they can call back when someone will be there to help them? So um, if, they, if you say, do you mind holding? And they say, I can't, I can't hold now. I, ha I, can't, I can't wait on the phone now. Then you can say, may I take a message and have someone call back? Or you can call us back at two o'clock this afternoon. Call us back at three o'clock this afternoon and someone will be here to help you because that makes all the difference. Again, you give them a choice. They're the ones in charge in a way because they decide, okay, um, I'll leave a message with this nice person and have someone call me back. Or I prefer to call back for whatever reason. Some people don't like to leave a message with a number because they don't really believe that anyone will call them back or they're afraid if they leave a, a name and number someone will call them back when they're not there and then it'll people calling each other back and never speaking so maybe they want to avoid that and they prefer to call back well you're giving them that uh, opportunity you're giving them that choice so it's very polite and courteous to give them uh, an alternative may i take a message and have someone call back or would you like to call back at four o'clock this afternoon when someone will be here to help you? And uh, then they can just tell you, well, I'll, I'll call back later. I'll call back tomorrow. Or here's, yes, here's my phone number. I have someone call me. Uh, here's my name again. They'll be, and you can ask them for their name again if they give you, your, if they give you their phone number. Okay, um, now, this is another subtle point, but it has to do with the impression you make when you speak in English on the office phone. If you use the speaker phone, you know, where it's loud and it's not just in your ear, but everyone can hear it. If you put someone on the speaker phone, it is polite and courteous to let the person who call know that. Okay, we are now on speakerphone. I've put you on speakerphone. Now, there's usually a reason that you put someone on speakerphone. You want uh, someone else to hear the conversation, to offer advice and help, whatever the reason is. But you want to say to the person who's called, now we're on speakerphone, so that they know, for whatever reason, it's just considered polite. Um, that they that to tell them that now you're talking to the room, you're not just talking to the person you're speaking to. Sometimes in an office conference situation, people will be put on speakerphone, and again, there it can be actually quite important because if they think they're talking um, to just you, and maybe they even know you, and they say, "Oh, by the way," uh, maybe they'll say some gossip or something like that, that they would not want to tell a whole room full of people. So they're really, it's important you know, to be polite and tell the person, okay, now we're on speakerphone and uh, yeah. the people can people, hear people. you. All right. Um, now, uh, again, calling people back. Um, Generally speaking, these are just general observations. They're not, you know, rules that are in iron. You can decide what suits your situation best. But um, generally, it's considered more polite and more courteous and more helpful to offer to call so someone back rather than to expect them to keep calling your office all day until they can get what they want or need. Because if you just say call back, and even if you say call back at two o'clock, because maybe, and it's possible, maybe at two o'clock, whatever the problem was, still has not been resolved and they still can't be helped. So how many times do they have to keep calling back 
in a way, it can be considered more polite to just say, well, we, we can call you back at, and tell them what time, or just say, we will call you later today by the end of the business day, or we will call you by tomorrow, or however you want to say that, to show that you know you are taking their requests seriously and you will follow up and call them back so that they do not have to keep trying all day to try to get in touch and try to speak to a person who can help. We will take uh, responsibility and we will have the person who can help call you. So we will make it easier for you, the caller, uh, by calling you back rather than leaving you with the responsibility of calling us all the time, repeatedly. How are we doing for them? Okay. Now, um, about keeping people on hold. Well, yes, people don't like to be kept on hold for a long, long, long time. Uh, and this is, this is uh, American office style or British office style, maybe Thai office style is not quite the same, but in uh, Anglo American office style, people speaking on the phone, if you have to put someone on hold, people check back 40 seconds later, less than one minute to ask if they still want to hold because um, I think the feeling is there's no point in waiting several minutes because by then it may already be too late and they will leave. So if they're in a rush, maybe they accept being put on hold, but maybe they think it's only going to be for a few seconds. 40 seconds is a fairly long time if you're just listening to silence. And if they really don't uh, have time to wait or if they're in a big rush, uh, they may have already decided that by 40 seconds, and but they won't have hung up themselves or gone away. They will still be there, but slightly unhappy because they are waiting longer than maybe they wanted to. So if we get back to them in 40 seconds, that's fairly quick. And then we can decide from there exactly what they would prefer. Do they want to... Um, have the option of calling back. They can call us back later in the day. Do they want us to call them back? Uh, again, uh, we can call by before tomorrow. Or do they want to keep holding? Is it OK? Do you mind holding a little longer, please? And if now they have three options, we can call them, they can call us, or they can continue holding. And it's a human being, since we're talking on the phone with the, the caller, the caller is getting a human being giving them these options. So the, the caller is getting good service because usually we just hear that awful recorded voice. And if you say the push, uh, push three, if you say, the, you know, which are extremely unpleasant, you know, with the call centers. Um, some people just press zero, 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 hoping that they'll get an operator, but that even that doesn't always work. Uh, so 40 second limit. If you put someone on hold fairly quickly, it might be nice to get back to them and give them those options and let them decide what they would prefer to do because then they can, they can plan the rest of their next several minutes of their life. And they can tell you, uh, what they want. And the more people can get sort of the option of doing what they want, the happier they are. So the caller will consider it a an efficient and well-run office if their phone call is dealt with fairly quickly. Even if they do not get the information immediately, at least their call is registered uh, and their name and number are written down. And, uh, and then they will be called back. Or if they're told, okay, we cannot help you right now, but please call us back and we will then be happy to help. Or again, the third option, 
Uh, if you don't mind holding, uh, we will be happy to, to help as soon as we can. Three options. Now, uh, when they absolutely cannot hold anymore, they say, sorry, I can't, I have to go, I can't do any more, I have, to, I have something else to do, I can't wait on the phone, then again, it's considered polite and courteous uh, to offer to call them back. May we call you back? May we call you back? What time would be good for us to call you back? Uh, when would be the best time to call you back? How can we help? And always, this is important, thank you for waiting. Thank you for waiting because it shows that we appreciate that they were patient. You know, you, often people are in a big hurry, especially if they call on the phone in an office and we have to speak to them in English. But we want to say thank you for waiting because we realize they had to wait and people don't like to wait. There's a famous... Um, story about King Louis the 14th of France, who was of course a very important king and very grand. He was called the Sun King because he was so great. And anyway, the reason I'm telling you about King Louis the 14th is because it has to do with waiting, although in those days they did not have the phone. Um, one day King Louis came down from his palace and got was about to get into the um, carriage, his royal carriage, this is a story, it probably never happened, but it's a very famous story in France. And the carriage came up right at the moment when he was ready to step into it. It just zoomed right up there. And, and he, his famous comment was, I almost had to wait. I almost had to wait, which is the sort of attitude of King Louis uh, at the horror of the idea that he, King Louis of France, the Sun King, almost had to wait. So generally speaking, people do not like to wait. And if someone waited on the phone, polite to, uh, to say thank you. Thanks for waiting. Thank you for waiting. Just it, it gives an impression of, of you as a very polite person and thoughtful and considerate. You realize that they spent some seconds or minutes of their day waiting and you want to acknowledge that and show that you appreciate that they did that. Now, um, this is another issue in a very busy day. Maybe you will have more than one phone call at the same time and maybe more than one person on hold. Now, in that situation where you're keeping more than one person on hold, it's what's called juggling, the juggling the calls you're juggling the calls, you have to try to remember who called first, that guy or this guy, this person or that person, because you want to obviously help the person who called first because they've been waiting the longest. So again, when you have more than one call, which can already be a little confusing, if you keep in mind, who was the one who called me first here, then that person will get the priority in a service because that person simply uh, was first in line, waited uh, the longest. And uh, you want to give the impression that there is a certain uh, ranking of calls according to who called first. It also keeps people from waiting too long because naturally, if you keep uh, helping the person who has just called more recently, the person who has called before is still waiting out there somewhere. <laughs> you know, for a long time, maybe, and they feel like they're be they've been forgotten and they feel sad. So the first person to call should always be the first person who we pay attention to. Now, when we transfer calls, if we must, and again, it's a question of, do we have to transfer? Uh, if we transfer, if they call and ask to speak to a person or an office, which is not our office, naturally we will want to transfer to the person they want or to the office they want. Um, however, in some cases we may say, uh, we may decide that we may try to solve the problem for them and maybe we don't need to transfer. So that's our decision really. 
uh, keeping in mind that no one likes to be transferred around into different offices and sometimes a caller, not, I'm not saying this happens in a library or anywhere else, but in some offices and call centers, uh, a caller will say, oh, they transferred me to that office and then they transferred me back to another office and then they transferred me somewhere else. So people generally don't like being transferred. They consider it as if no one will take responsibility for their call and no one wants to help them. So they just push them off to someone else. They transferred me to a different office. So that's not always a good look, not always a good professional impression if we transfer, but sometimes we just naturally have to transfer. We are being asked to transfer. I would like to speak to so-and-so. Uh, could I speak to the office of whatever it is? And then in that case, they really do want to be transferred. They need to be transferred for us to do whatever it is they want us to do. So when we must transfer a call, um, we can tell them why, why we're transferring. I'm transferring you to the office where that person is. I'm transferring you to, transferring you to that person's office. I am transferring you to the office that can take care of your request. In other words, I'm not just transferring you because I don't like your voice or I'm tired or I want to eat my snack. I'm not transferring you because I'm bored. I'm transferring you actually because it will help you. And that's very important to tell them that. Because again, transferring sometimes can have a bad reputation and we want to reassure the caller that we're transferring them for good reason. We're transferring them because they need to be transferred. I'm transferring you to that person. I'm transferring you to the office where they can help. Uh, and also, again, after you tell them why you want to transfer them, always polite, always courteous to say, may I transfer you? May I transfer you? May I transfer you? Because we ask if they can transfer. Again, the impression that we make in an office phone call when we speak in English, and if we just transfer without explaining or even telling them, someone says, can I have the rare book room? And we're answering the phone, maybe in the information desk. If we just transfer and don't even tell them what's happening, all they hear is clicks and they don't know what happened. Did some, they don't know if someone <laughs> hung up on them or what happened. So if we speak and if we tell them what we're going to do and then ask them if that's okay, then again, we're, we're explaining why we're doing this, why we're transferring, we're doing it to help them and we're giving them the choice. Maybe for whatever reason, and again, we don't know, maybe they'll say, no, no, don't transfer me. Don't, uh, not right now, wait a minute. Don't transfer for whatever reason. And when we give them the option of telling them why we want to transfer them and then ask them, may I transfer you? We're showing them respect. We're giving them the power in the conversation. We're allowing them choice. We're making them the person who decides. We're not just sending them around as we want. We're asking them, may I transfer you? because we've already told them <laughs> that we will transfer you to the office that can help you, or we will transfer you to that person's office. May I transfer you? And then when they say, okay, bye now, you know, and then you transfer them, or may I transfer you? No, 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 don't transfer me yet. I have a question or whatever it is. And you say, okay, fine, what is your question or how can I help? How can I help? May I transfer you? These are just ways of being polite and courteous on the office phone in English. Um, again, this is a more subtle or sensitive issue, but it has to do with the impression we give on the phone. Um, I mean, they know anytime anyone calls a phone, uh, an office phone, 
anyone who calls realizes that the people at the office are busy. They have many things to do. Uh, they want to solve the problem and get on to the next thing that they have to do or the next caller or the next issue. So you may seem uh, somewhat in a rush, but you don't want to give the impression of just getting rid of them. In other words, handing them over to someone else. I don't want this problem right now, so here I'm, I'm transferring you. So better to give a reason why you're transferring them because that shows that you're not just sending them off somewhere and that you want to help. So you're sending them to the place where they can be helped uh, the most efficiently. And you don't want to what they call the run around, you know, running around to be given the run around. There's also an expression, an idiom in English to have be given a wild goose chase be put on a wild goose chase has to do with wild geese and running after them. Uh, so in other words, if you call an office, uh, you don't want to have the experience of a wild goose chase of running after different people and never really getting to speak to anyone who can help. So if you get a sense when you're talking to someone on the office phone in English, if you give them the sense that you're there to help, that you're ready to help, that everything you do on the phone is to help. And so when you say, uh, may I transfer you to that office? May I transfer you to that person's office? It shows that you are asking them to be polite if you can actually do what they want you to do, if, if you can get them to where they can get the assistance that they have requested, that's all. And it makes you look very professional and makes you look serious and helpful. And that you're concerned with the person who called. You're not just trying to move off the call and have someone else deal with it, pass it along. You know. Because in a, in a library in Thailand, it's not really the same thing, but in some offices around the world, and we can encounter this when we make office calls to international companies or to other corporations or who knows, giant libraries maybe. There are so many different phones and so many different offices that if we do um, get transferred, sometimes we can get the feeling, oh, where are we being transferred to? What's happening now? Uh, and so the more information someone gives us when we call them, or the more information we give to someone when they call us, the more they feel like they're informed, they're not lost, they're with the right person who wants to help them. And when they get transferred, it is to be helped even more. So all of these make a very good impression and a positive professional effect uh, in terms of office speech on the telephone in English. Now, uh, when you transfer, first be sure to talk to the person who is in our office uh, or the department or the person that you plan to transfer to, to make sure they can take the call immediately. That means immediately. So if you are speaking to someone, a caller, you don't want to transfer them to some line where no one answers or you don't want to transfer them to a line where it will take a long time for someone to pick up. So to be polite and courteous, when you transfer, first test the line, make sure someone is there to answer and someone is there to answer right away because you want again to make the impression and to give the sense to the caller that you are helping and you are transferring them to someone who can help right away, very efficient. So by testing, trying first to get in touch with the other line with the person or office that you want to transfer to and make sure they're there. And then you will say, oh, hi, I'm gonna transfer you a call, someone who has been on hold, who wants to speak to or who needs help with and you're talking in Thai language probably because you're talking to your 
colleague at the office. So you want to say this is an international call, someone speaking English uh, needs help with uh, whatever it is need, or wants to speak to whoever it is. And I'm transferring the call right now. So make it clear to the person who works with you, your friend from the office, that they will be getting a call transferred right away uh, and that they can then take over. Uh, and it helps to have that connection because as I say, otherwise, if you just say, I'll transfer you and then you transfer them to some line where maybe the people are out of the office that day or maybe they're not answering or they're somewhere busy or something. So you've been helping the person and then you transfer them and then they're just someone, it's just ringing the phone and nothing happens to help them. Sometimes they may just hang up and maybe call back and you get them again and you say, oh, hello, you know, me again, hello. You transferred me, but no one picked up. That's embarrassing. That's not the best you know, impression. So always test and try the line before you actually transfer the call. Um, and again, if your friend from the office or your colleague can take the call right away, they'll tell you, oh, I can't take that call right now. Uh, please tell them to call back in the afternoon or the person they want to speak to isn't here right now. Your friend will tell you, someone in the office. Uh, have them call tomorrow, have them call at four o'clock this afternoon. But if they can take the call right now, good idea to tell the person, tell your friend, tell the person who works with you in the office in a different department or different area, what the caller, well, whatever it is you know about the caller, what they want, what they need, any other information that you know about them so that they can help the caller so that the caller doesn't have to say the whole thing all over again. Because if you just transfer the call uh, to a new office, they don't know the caller and then they have to go through the whole story again. It, maybe it's a long, complicated problem. You don't know. So if you've already heard what it is and you understood everything that it, it, what, that, it, uh, that it deals with, you can tell your friend or colleague what the caller may need or give them some idea. Even if you didn't understand everything, you could say, I think it's about this, but you could check with them to make sure to see what they need. Or maybe it's just transferring to someone who speaks English better. You never know. But whatever it is, you can give as much information as you can to your friend in the office, to your colleague, so that they are ready to help very soon. They are ready to help the caller uh, almost immediately. As soon as they get on the phone with them, they'll say, oh, um, I understand that you are looking for this, or you need this, or you want that, or you want to speak to the person who is in charge of whatever. And maybe it's not right. Maybe you misunderstood, but that's a good chance to clarify and for the caller to explain to the new person, your friend from the office or your colleague, and say, no, no, I need this. I don't want that. Or I need to speak to this person, not that person. So they will, again, at least make it clear what it is they want. They'll repeat that much. But if you understood what they need, uh, then it helps your friend in the office, your colleague, if you tell them uh, what the person has already told you. So you should share that information. Okay. It saves time in the long run. And then you go back to the caller. Once you are sure that there is another person who is at the other end of the line, who is ready immediately to take their call, and who is ready to help them and wants to help, go back to the caller, tell them who you're transferring them to. I'm transferring you to our circulation department. I'm transferring you to our rare book room. I'm transferring you to the director's office. And then this is an important detail. It may seem like a small point, but you really 
win a friend when you do this. You say, if you get cut off, here is the direct phone line for the place you are transferring them to. I'm transferring you to the rare book room. If you get cut off, here is the direct phone line for the rare book room. Here is the direct phone line for the circulation desk. And when you give the direct phone line for these places that you're transferring them to, they can write that down and have a copy. And it's very useful for them because maybe they have to call later in the day or tomorrow or for whatever reason, they have the phone and they don't have to call you next time. They can call directly unless they lose the number. But if they keep the number, they can call directly to the place they need or the place, person they want to speak to, and that will save time. So before you transfer, when you've told them again, because you've already told them where, where you would like to transfer them to, and uh, you've already told them why you want to transfer them there, and then uh, you say again, I will be, so now I'm transferring you to the circulation desk. Here is the number of the circulation desk. Here is the direct number. Here is the direct line of the circulation desk in case you get cut off, in case there's any problem. Just for your own records, for your own information, here is the direct line of the circulation desk, valuable information, because if there's something you don't know, but maybe they might need to speak several times to the circulation desk for whatever their issue is or their, their subject conversation is. So it actually helps them a great deal to have that direct line. They don't have to go through the answering uh, a process of having the general number of the library and then calling the wrong person and then having to be transferred. They can go directly to the office they need and they feel much more professional and efficient. And they're impressed with your professionalism and efficiency because you have uh, shown the initiative to give them the direct line. Sometimes people may even ask for a direct phone number, especially if they decide that they want to call us back. They may say, is there a direct phone number that I can call, but sometimes they don't remember to ask that. And then they have to go through the whole process again. Uh, but the direct phone is a very valuable uh, piece of information. So we should keep that in mind. Uh, again, you know, why bother to give them the direct phone? Because it's helpful. And again, it, they may not use the direct phone number. Maybe they don't care but it seems like you care. You wanna give the impression that you wanna help, that you care, that you're right there helping and that you're assisting them when they need assistance. And so it makes you look very efficient. And if you don't know, which you may not know, who to transfer a call to, take their number, the person who calls, and ask around in your friends in the office who can take such a call. Who would be the person to ask? You know, do a little bit of research and they will tell you and you can call the person back and tell them uh, who to call. What, who is the direct, uh, the direct line to uh, the call? Then um, finally, <laughs> it's a long process this transferring, but finally, if you, uh, before you send the person to the transfer, let the caller know if they don't hear back right away from the right department, invite them, please call me again. And here's my, my name and phone number. So make sure they have your name and your phone number because maybe for whatever reason they need uh, to call you again. And you've been so helpful and you've been so nice. And you try to make every effort to make their experience good. So they might want to call you again and, and ask for help again. They consider you a serious professional and very skilled at what you do. 
and uh, they may need to ask for help. So if they, again, if you, before you send them off the last time, just assure them, please, if anything, if you need further help, feel free to call again. Uh, and here's my name and here's my number. And it shows again that you're not just, you know, ready to get rid of them and happy to just pass them along to someone else. You want to show them that you care about them and that you're willing to continue helping them until their problem is solved or until their question is answered. Uh, that makes a good impression because they want, uh, again, on the phone, when you just hear a voice, it is very difficult to get it to give it to give and to get a sense of continuity of people who really are willing to sustain interest in whatever the problem is. So if you show that you're willing to be called back, here's my name and number again, uh, feel free to call back if there's any further problem uh, and just go right ahead and call back if you like. Uh, that makes a very good professional impression in any office. Now, how can you find out who's calling? Well, there are different ways of ask, answering the same question. Um, there are polite Mental phrases. Shall, shall we have a break for 15 minutes? I'm hearing an echo. Shall, shall we have a break for 15 minutes? Pause. Break. Have a, a break. break. Okay, yeah, fine. Yeah, for 15 minutes. Okay. Okay, so we may uh, come back at uh, 11 a.m. Well, actually, this is a bit slower than I thought, yeah. And and we don't really seem to have many questions, right? Actually, we we have some questions. Uh, they are directly sent it to me, so I wait for like the time to ask you. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, feel free to ask any questions that you like because uh, I have all these powerpoints. I think. Because by the end, people are already gone. I think maybe, maybe better to um, uh, just have them, you know, like or or perhaps when we start again, we can. Ah, we, okay. Yeah, now we have fifteen minutes until eleven o'clock, right? It's ten yes. forty-six, so we have fifteen-minute break. But when we start again, we can start with questions before before we go back to the PowerPoint. I still don't think. Three, three, isn't three hours a very long time? Isn't it boring? I mean, does anybody stay for three hours? I see we have 40 participants, but... Yeah, most of people interesting in English, in, in the daily English. use, yeah. Okay, well, as so long believe, as it's not too yeah. boring. I don't want to <laughs> bore the people. No, it's you not know. boring. Oh, it's interesting. Okay. All right, well, I'll stretch my legs. I'll go. <laughs> okay, I'll see you. The air is so bad in
I cannot hear anything. Uh, could you please turn on your microphone? Mute, right? How about that? Okay, I have already. Yay. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Punjab. Um, welcome back, everybody. Um, let's take a few questions because I don't know if we're going to get all, all through the PowerPoints today. Uh, we have a, many, many PowerPoints, but you're all welcome to ask for the PowerPoints and we will send you the PowerPoints if it will help. And you can just look at them when you have a moment um, to see maybe the, the ones at the very end of the presentation. What, um, are there any questions now, Kunjan, from our friends? Yes. Uh, they ask that what is the proper word to call the person if uh, if we don't know their name on the phone? Well, okay. If we don't know their name, one of the things we can do is ask their name. Uh, may I have your name? May I know your name? Um, Sometimes it's a little sensitive because when you speak to someone on the phone, you may not always know if it's a man or a woman. That can be a problem. And that's a sensitive issue. You don't want to call someone sir because they have a low voice and it turns out it's a woman. The woman is usually not happy. Or if you, you're, you, know, the, you have someone who's a man but has a very high voice, you don't want to call them ma'am because maybe it's a, a man with a high voice. So the best thing is, may I take your name? May I know your name? May I write down your name, please? And that way you can get a sense of maybe whether whether they're a man or a woman and um, and then call them by the name that they've given you. Yeah. Hope that answers the question. Next question. For the next question, uh... I have a problem with alphabet when we have to spell. Do you have any spelling tips at, as they use in the hotel phone? Spelling right. tips, yeah. Well, um, one of the things, and I, I don't know how you know everyone's office is different, but if you're talking on the phone and you also have a laptop or a desktop computer or something, if you write, if you can open a Word document, just temporarily, uh, a Word document has spell check. So if you have trouble spelling and you're spelling it on a Word document, you can do a spell check and it will offer you different spellings and some of them are correct. So if, or it will tell you by underlining in red if you've just written something that is not correct spelling. So that's one way uh, that you can take a note uh, in English and, uh, uh, and then uh, have word spell check, uh, see if it is correct or not. However, with names, word spell check doesn't really help. So with names, you just really have to make sure that you're spelling it correctly when you take someone's name down. And again, they'll understand and they'll want you to repeat it, you know, once or twice just to make sure that you're spelling the name correctly. Because that's that's also a sign of respect and politeness is that you care to get their name correct, uh, that you are interested in them enough as a caller to make sure that you have the right spelling of their name. Yeah. But if it's a, just in general spelling, you could try to do the word uh, word document temporary word document where you can uh, get a quick spell check right away and then you'll see if you're spelling words correctly or not in English. Okay, so uh, you can I also, believe... I mean, if you have more time, you could send any text, as I said before, you can send it to the Thomasat Library abstract editing service or send me an email or send Mod an email, you know, but that's if you have more time. If you have to get something spelled right right away immediately, then Word uh, will tell you at least some choices. But if if it's something that can wait, you know, a few hours, then send it to the Atomasat Library Abstract Editing Service, or send send an email to me or to put mod and uh, and ask for help. We're always happy. Next, so Benjamin. Question. 
I I believe that she uh refer to when it's have to spelling for for a person on the phone like A for Apple or A for Amsterdam. Which one would we use? Or is have to be only the country name to be referred to the alphabet? Oh, I see. Oh, so if you're saying A as in Apple, B yeah. as in boy, whatever. I think it doesn't matter. I think as long as it's clear what you're saying um, and the word is recognizable, um, I, I think sometimes the words, uh, if it's not clear what the word is or what the first letter of the word is, then it's not a good choice. Because if you're saying, um, just try to think of one now. Um, I, well, I, I can't really think of anything off the top of my head. But if you're if you're trying to say, um, for example, if if you if you say um, n as in numnim, well, they don't know numnim, and they don't know it's a name, and they don't know it's a cat. So it's not a good example of of you shouldn't say n as in numnim. You should say n as in Nancy or Nation or Norman or some either an Anglo name or a uh, a thing that is fairly well known, and then they will know how to spell those. Yeah, but um, normally and with all as with all things in English, if someone doesn't understand you, the best thing is to say the same thing in a different way. Or say something different. Don't don't keep saying the same thing again and again because for whatever reason they don't understand you, whether it's your pronunciation or whether it's their problem, you don't know. Try a different word or try don't just keep saying N like Norman, say N like Nancy, N like you know nomenclature, any word that begins with N, because if they don't understand one word maybe they'll understand another word you know and so choose a different try different things don't just keep with the same thing because if they didn't understand it before chances are they won't understand it the second time and the third time and after a while it just starts to irritate them that you know that you, you have to keep repeating and they still don't understand it seems you know frustrating so just change the word if they don't understand or for whatever reason, they, they're not following you. Okay, thank you so much. So we have one more question. Okay. We always get a transfer call from the central office. The call always asks, can you speak English? What should I reply? Yes, I can. May I, yes, I can. May I help you? Or I should greet like, hello, this of this office of da 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 may i help you so it, it, a call comes in and the first thing someone says is can you speak english right yes That's the yes. thing well you could say neat noi you know <laughs> no the <laughs> no, serious response that was just a joke a serious response uh would be uh yes if you start to speak english it's clear that you can speak english you don't have to tell them, you know, your grades in school or how much English you can speak or a little or whatever. You don't have to start with that. You just start by speaking English and you hope that they will recognize that you're speaking English and they won't think that you're speaking some foreign language. And uh, if you speak slowly and clearly enough, they will realize, oh, this person is speaking English. I don't have to worry. Uh, they've answered my question by, by saying hello in English. Hello, this is the office of blah, blah, blah. My name is blah, blah. How may I help you? By the time you get to how may I help you, they realize you speak a little English and that you're there to help them. So you don't have to worry, I think, about answering that question immediately. Because when you start to speak English, you have answered the question, you know. It's like if someone said, are you there or is anyone there? And if you start to speak, hello, uh, you know, you don't have to say, I am there, I am here. You know, it's clear that you're there because you're answering, you're speaking. 
Is that it? The last question? Okay, yes, that's that's all. The question okay. you can continue on the Okay, well, if there are any more, just let me know. And that's so um, let's go through speedily through the rest of it because we have many, many, many PowerPoints. Um, if someone is calling, let me see if I can, if someone is calling the director, yes, she's in. May I tell her who's calling, please? Or she's, whoops, she's away from her office. May I take your name and number? May I say who's calling? Thank you. Let me check and see if she's in. Let me check. Don't give too much information. You don't have to, someone asks to speak to a librarian. You don't have to say she's getting her hair done or her car needs to be repaired or other personal things in her life. They don't care and they don't need to know that stuff. So just, you know, tell them more like she's away from her office. May I take your name and number? That's enough. That's all they need to know. Unless, of course, it's someone who's a member of their family and, you know, or, or you know them or there's other things. But if it's just the standard caller in an office, you never give private information. And, you know, pleasant, kind. If you don't understand, try not to be silent or get someone. Get someone who speaks some English. Uh, if you don't understand, say, I'm sorry, I do not understand. I will try to find someone for you who speaks English. Um, try to speak, be brave. Uh, would you kindly say that again more slowly? Please say that even more slowly. I still do not see what you mean. If they you know, have a strange accent or you just don't understand. Now, when you write down the messages, there are forms for phone messages. I don't know if we have them in the office, maybe not. But try to make, you know, a, write it not just on a little piece of paper, but on a serious piece of paper, a big enough so that the, all the information is clear. The name of the person who called, get the spelling right, Google it if you need to, uh, the name of the university or the name of their office. Uh, put in uh, who they work for, their phone numbers. If they give you an office phone, you could ask for a cell phone number. Is there a cell phone number too uh, in the message that you're putting for your friend or for the person in the office, the colleague, date and time of the call? Also put in, please call, or they will call back, or urgent, if they consider it urgent. Um, and try to make it clear to what are your friends or what someone, you know, who is your colleague has to do, not just all the information, but what they expect, what the caller expects. They expect you to call them. They expect you to do something. So when you leave a message for someone, try to do it quickly and assume that all messages are private. You know, you don't want, you don't know, but Try not to spread it around for whatever reason. Usually it doesn't matter. It's just an office message, but sometimes it could be a little sensitive. So you want to keep it private. Um, in a message, you fold it in half so that just not everybody can read it. Um, and returning the phone call promptly so you don't do what they call playing phone tag. One person calls another and then they can't get through. Uh, so when you call someone, ask for the time you can call back and find the person in the office. When is the best time for me to call again? When is the best time for them to call me back? And they'll tell you, you know, or you tell them, I expect her to return by two o'clock. You can reach her between two and five, or I'm not sure when she will return. So please leave a phone number and when you can be reached. Uh, when you leave a message, especially voicemail, don't give a long message. Keep it very short. Name, contacts, when you can be reached. That's all. Don't give a whole story because people don't have time to listen to you. You know. And when you're calling out um, or calling for your supervisor, note the number carefully and put it on a frequently called numbers list so you have a record of the number. You can get it again if you need to, and you can get it quickly. 
Uh, when you call, say who you are, where you work, what you're calling about. We talked about that. I'm calling about this. May I speak to that? You know, I am calling about. Uh, if you don't have a name, try to make it clear when you're calling what you want or what you need. And they don't want to, people who you call don't really want to guess what you, why you're calling. So you should be able to tell them, I'm calling to ask for this, or I'm calling to request that and you want paper nearby or something to write on so you can remember what happened. And then you want to tell the person you call that what you plan to do next. So, so I will call again in one hour and I hope to find an ex in the office. I will call again. Tell them what you're going to do so they know. Uh, if you get a voicemail and you have to leave a message, speak slowly and clearly, uh, department, phone number, date, and time, although machines usually record that, but just to be sure, hello, it's uh, Monday at 3 p.m., and I am, you know, and please call me back at 2 o'clock tomorrow. Uh, ending a phone conversation. You want to be polite, but you also want it to stop. So after everything has been exchanged, all the information, the way to end the phone call is to say, I'm glad you called, or I'm glad we resolved this concern, or even best, really, thank you for calling. Thank you for calling. It shows that you don't hate them, you know. And um, again, repeat that you're going to do something or they should do something as you agreed in the conversation and mention when these things will happen. I will call back tomorrow at 2. Or please call us back. So please call us back tomorrow or two. That's what you decided in the conversation, but you want to make sure at the end that that's what everybody agrees will happen. In an office phone conversation in English, better to say goodbye because bye-bye or see ya or whatever is sort of informal English and not maybe respectful enough for some people. Uh, Try not to be too bossy. You know, you want to sound like you're confident, but you don't want to tell them, you must, you have to, you need to. It sounds like you're pushing them. Don't do that. Uh, ask them, would you please, or would you kindly, would you kindly call back at three o'clock? And try not to say, again, don't be negative. Don't say your problem or your complaint, whatever. Your question or your concern is better than your problem. Have you got a problem? People, when they fight in, in, in America, they say, have you got a problem? And then they start to punch the person. So better not to talk about problems. You know. Instead of saying, again, be positive, don't be negative. Instead of saying, I can't do that, or it's not my job, tell them what you can do. I can transfer you to someone who will be able to help you. I can transfer you to that office. And instead of saying, I have no idea, again, being positive, say, although I cannot change the policy myself, this is about if someone doesn't like something or an experience they had, I will speak to my supervisor about your concern. I will speak to my supervisor and try to be calm. It's difficult to kind of, to not show panic and not show that you're upset. May I put you on hold instead of just hang on, hang on? No. May I put you on hold? You're asking them. And instead of saying who's calling, say, may I say who is calling, please? May I say who is calling, please? Instead of I can't hear you louder, say, I'm having a little difficulty hearing you. Can you please speak up? Instead of saying I can't help you, say, I need to transfer your call to the X department so that they can answer your question. May I do so? May I? And uh, don't say someone is absent. Say she's not in right now. Absent has to do with a child or a soldier. You know. If you don't understand, say, I do not understand. Would you please repeat that more slowly? If they repeat it, you still don't understand. I will get someone who understands English better. May I put you on hold? 
if they don't want to be put on hold and there's no one around who can speak better English, say, may I take a message? And if the office is missing calls, ask someone who works with you or your friend to answer your phone if you're away from the desk. If you're out of the office for a long time, ask people to just cut, you know, answer the phone when you're not there. But when you do answer the phone, try to be responsible and not forward if you can, if you can solve it yourself. Um, again, this is just repeating what we did before about putting people on calls, try to return calls within one day. Sometimes the, the foreigner, the international call, they can sound upset or angry for whatever reason, maybe it has nothing to do with you or the, or anything really, but just try to seem understanding. I'm sorry about that. Tell me what happened. Tell me, shows you're interested in their experience. You're ready to help. You want to hear the issue. You will take notes to help you imp remember important details and then say how you will help and be sure to do so. You know, you want to help. Try to say their name as often as you can. It shows that you noted the name correctly and are serious about the call. Speak slowly and use all the consonants. <clears throat> Let the caller hang up first and hang up the receiver gently, click, because if it slams, they may think you're angry. Uh, better not to use voicemail because people's voicemails are full. Of don't interrupt people if they're speaking. Let them finish their sentence or idea before you speak. If you dial the wrong number, apologize and try to be understanding if people dial you by mistake, which happens sometimes. Uh, try not to speak to anyone else when you're, while you're on the phone with someone. Uh, when you answer the phone, give the caller your full attention. Repeat the person's name and phone number before you hang up. Then the person can correct any mistakes if the name is wrong or the phone number is wrong. And, you know, could you spell that for me or would you mind repeating that for me? Uh, when you say goodbye, better not to say, have a nice day, because, you know, something terrible may have happened and it's not a nice day where they are for whatever reason, it's that that expression sometimes upsets people. Uh, and then in class, no. all right, well, there we are. Any other further questions or uh, issues that anyone would like to raise before we end this uh, very nice uh, session? Any other uh, question? Uh, there is a question. Uh, what would I say if the other person speak too quickly? Well, you could say, um, could you please repeat that more slowly? I did not understand what you said. Uh, would you kindly repeat that more slowly? Or would you kindly say that again more slowly? And if you really can't understand after a couple of times, as I say, uh, if they don't think of saying it in a different way, you may really need, if, if possible, someone else to speak to them, in which case you may need to transfer if you just don't understand what they're saying. You know, you, you've done your best, but it, the problem is to have them repeat again and again and again, that doesn't make a great impression because they get frustrated or impatient and you want to sort of say, well, we're solving your problem quickly. And if you just can't understand what it is they're saying, Again, it may not be your problem. It may be they're speaking in a, you know, from Bhutan in some accent or some strange uh, way of speaking English, which is just not familiar. And it's not your fault. You are not to blame. You don't understand. You know, they're speaking in unusual English. So maybe you need either a native speaker of English. I mean, I'm always happy to help if I'm in the office. Or you need someone who you feel would be able to to understand almost any strange English, if you really can't understand. And that person would be the person to transfer to or to have uh, them call back to, or to have uh, your friend, whoever it is, who can answer, understand all English, uh, you can have your friend call them back. Because sometimes really the, the accent from some countries may be just so unusual, or the person may be so 
uncomfortable with English, maybe somewhere in Asia or the ASEAN community or somewhere else in the world, you know, where they just speak a very strange, unusual form of English. So we have to deal with these people and help them and we want to help and we want to be nice to them and polite and respectful and courteous. So the way to do it, instead of just having them repeat and making it very clear that we still don't understand them, solve the problem by passing that to someone who might understand. Uh, that might be one way. The worst case is if you absolutely can't understand and you absolutely have no one else to transfer to, you might ask them to send an email so that you can see what the, their written, the written question is. Maybe that would be easier than speaking. Any other questions? That's it. Uh, okay. How about if the signal is too bad, how, how can we tell them? on uh, the other person on the phone? Well, uh, yeah, I think everyone who uses cell phones is familiar with the signal being bad. You know, that's not yeah. unusual. Uh, well, I think, it, you know, there, if you say, I'm sorry, the signal is bad, or you keep breaking up, I'm sorry, um, shall we try again? Or uh, can I call you back? At that point, you might just try to call them back. Uh, and I hope that you have a better signal or you can go and call them from a different place and maybe get a better signal. Um, I think it's polite if you suggest that you could call them back, maybe they would prefer if the signal is bad because probably the signal's bad for them too. Uh, maybe they prefer to call you back and they will, you know, you can tell them when you, you might, uh, they might try to do that uh, with a better signal and you hope for a better signal. You know, but that's something that neither you or the person who's calling are to blame. It's not your fault. It's just, you know, phone transmission. And, uh, you know, we are, at least in the British Panamyang Library, we're underground. So obviously there's often phone uh, transmission issues in other libraries, which are above ground or other departments. It, um, it may be uh, less of an issue, but yeah. I think it's perfectly fine to say, uh, may I call you back and we'll hope for a better phone, you know, phone signal, or would you like to call back and we can try for a better uh, phone signal? That will be fine. They will understand. They won't be offended. Okay, Next. Hakun Ben, there, is, there are some questions coming in. So the first one, I had never interviewed via phone and feel nervous. There is no word come out from my mouth. How could I improve my experience? <laughs> well, yes, it is a problem. This is what I was talking about at the beginning of the presentation. I don't know if you, you heard that beginning part, but it has to do with people just being so terrified and being so frightened and scared that they're too nervous to speak, you know? And I think it happens very often in Thailand because it is a national problem of speaking English. People are not happy speaking English. There are a few people, but I think it's not fair that the people who tend to be happiest speaking English, either they're the people with no education at all, who don't really know English, but who are selling, as I mentioned, they sell Coca-Cola at the uh, at the uh, at the food court and. They're just, in, you know, having a nice time in their life and they're amused, amused by the idea of themselves speaking English. So they look entertained when they speak the two words that they know in English. They look delighted. They, they can't really speak English, but they're not nervous or afraid or upset. And then there are the rich people whose parents send them, you know, to Switzerland or to England and they spend most of their life or maybe all their life overseas. And of course, then they can speak English. But I don't think a language should only be for people who are rich. You know, it's not a good idea in Thailand, where there's very little social mobility compared to Vietnam and other places. In Thailand, they should have for everyone the possibility of using English comfortably, of feeling happy with English, because it's an economic thing. It's a, you know, 
they sometimes say, well, why should English be the common language of Asia? Why should English be in ASEAN? Why can't it be something else? Well, it's not because English is better as a language than anything else. The only reason everybody in Asia speaks English, if they want to understand, is it's simple. All the historians and demographers and every, linguists all explain it's because the British were here for, for 200 years and more. So the British colonized most of, of uh, Asia and everyone's got the habit of speaking English, except in Thailand, which, of course, was invaded by the Burmese and by the Japanese during the war. But was never colonized. However, um, the Chinese would love everyone to speak Chinese. But for that to happen, they've already tried Chinese when they do business with India. They try to have the Indian people learn Chinese to deal with them. And for the general language of Asia to be Chinese, the Chinese would have to invade all the countries in Asia. And then after 200 years, then maybe there would be uh, you know, uh, everyone speaking Chinese. So in our lifetime, it's going to remain English. So we have to just deal with it and have a, a comfortable, as, as comfortable as possible time. But I think that really one of the ways also, in addition to what I talked about in the beginning of the presentation, of don't be afraid, don't be embarrassed, don't be ashamed. It's not your problem with English. It is the whole country's problem with English. I think also, I assume everyone here is working as a professional or working in a library or maybe other jobs in um, uh, at the university and other uh, or students at the university. Uh, but very few work in what might be called life or death jobs. I mean, relatively few are working in the police or working in an emergency room at a, at a hospital or having real issues where speaking English may be the difference between life and death. Most of the time, most of the time we can relax because if we make a mistake, my pen and I, you know, it actually doesn't matter. You know, years from now, no one will remember or care if we said something, the wrong thing, or if we didn't say it in the way we wanted to, it doesn't matter. So we are not that important that if we make a mistake, it actually, we should worry about it. We should just try to relax and say whatever we can and be friendly. And just as when we see someone in real life and they visit the office and we're pleasant to them and we have a nice uh, discussion, on the phone, at least in theory, we could do the same thing if we're not too worried about it, if we're not too nervous about just having that phone and the words that come in in English you know, it's, it is a challenge and it has to, I think the best way to get more comfortable and more relaxed and feeling more free and more easy with speaking on the office phone in English is to do what I said a little bit before, which is the total immersion, namely every free moment you have, if you can, and then if you want to, it's up to you, it's your life, you know, but it's like if I was telling you how you can ride a bicycle and have the most fun, or how you can ride a motorcycle and have the most fun. You would figure out that probably you should just do it a lot, and then you'll stop falling off, and then you'll get better at it, and then, then you won't worry. Similarly, in English, to be able to speak on the phone and not be so afraid, uh, you should just do it more. And when you have Sanuk time, do your Sanuk in English. As I've often told people, whatever it is you like to read about, read about it in English. Um, and uh, the more English you use all the time, uh, the more sort of uh, comfortable you'll be when you have to use it and you won't be surprised or shocked so much. But, you know, if I told you, oh, you, you know, swimming is good exercise, but I'm, I'm so afraid to go swimming. If I go into the pool, what will happen? Oh, no. You know, then, of course, I will never swim and I will never do the exercise because I'm afraid. And, you know, I'm afraid to go on my bicycle because I might fa fall off. Well, people do fall off bicycles, but generally they just get up again and they go back on the bicycle and then they continue their bicycle. So whatever physical activity you do, you might be afraid or you might, you know, be worried about it. But ultimately, 
if you can get past, again, what I call the Freudian trauma or another Freudian word, neurosis, which is just worried so much that you can't do anything, if you can get past that, um, and you sort of have to do it on your own because it's, I think the support is lacking, unfortunately. We need more support, as I said, from speech therapists, neurologists, uh, psychologists, behavioral therapists, psychiatrists. All these people should have input about why the level of English ability in Thailand is, is not better. And I think until we have a really thorough approach and to help people, you know, to help the majority of people, not just a few people who are privileged and who are from rich families, you know, but all of the people, the Thai people can benefit. I think until that happens, each person has to invent their own method for feeling more comfortable and having more fun because it can be fun. Again, if you look at the food court and you look at the, the way that the Coca-Cola lady sells to the Faram, you will see that they almost seem to be, you know, having not everybody, but some of them seem to actually find it amusing to communicate in their two or three words, or even on the bus, the lady who sells the tickets will sometimes talk to a farang, you know, and give them a, a couple of words of English, and then they seem to have a good time. So it it is possible to have a good time despite whatever problems you feel. It really has to do with your attitude. And so the whole purpose of this presentation is to just try to find ways to help make you feel better when you have to have this situation and not think it's a crisis, crisis, when you have to answer the phone in the office in English, oh no, oh no, emergency, oh, far wrong on the phone, oh no, because it's not such a terrible thing, really. It, it sort of works out anyway. And the more relaxed you are, usually the better it works out. So to not panic, to not feel upset, or like you have a headache or whatever English usually does to you, uh, you know, people associate English with boredom and pain, <laughs> terrible feelings and humiliation and failure. English is usually associated with most Thai people with terrible, terrible emotions. And people who are successful, as I said, in other things, the one thing that they feel they failed in maybe is English if, or maybe mathematics or both. So the thing to do is to really just have it, try to make yourself have a better impression of English and not suffer so much. You know? And if you make it easy for yourself, you will have a better experience and you will be happier. But you have to spend a little time and I think that's really the secret. You each, you have to design your own program. If you would like to speak, you know, to me a little more about how you can find your own way to do better English, send an email to us, you know, send right to the library, let me know, I'm happy to help. You know, we're always happy to talk to people or help with the Thomas Ott Library Abstract Editing Service or whatever other library service to kind of help people feel more comfortable with what they have to do in their in their job or in their studies. So uh, always feel free to contact us for personalized recommendations because these are all very general uh, suggestions. You know, they're, they're supposed to apply to everyone. But if you want specific uh, things that you have to do and to deal with, uh, please feel free and let us know and uh, send an email or write to us online or write to us, you know, however you normally contact the library. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Benjamin. I oh, think uh, before we go to the next question of Kun Vasana, uh, Kun Panyapat has one question about how, uh, what to say if, if she have no idea to whom that she can transfer the line to. Even I already took time to find out what should I deal with this situation? Well, yeah, it really depends what it is because each each thing is different, right? Each situation is different. But if you if you feel you can deal with it, 
then that's fine, then deal with it. If you don't know what to do and there's no one to transfer, then that's the best time to either take their number and their name and call them back when someone else, you know, a friend or some, someone else in the office can help you or um, suggest that they call back later in the day and give them, you know, a, a time to call back when there'll be other people in the office who can maybe then give advice. But sure, you know, sometimes it's just not possible. Um, and it depends what it is they want, how, how, you know, whether they need an answer in the next 10 minutes, uh, what, what it is they're asking for. And sometimes you can wait a few hours. And then in that case, you can call them, they can call you. And, and that's fine. You know, they will understand if you absolutely have no idea what to do. And um, if you think you can help, then, you know, then and you want to be brave <laughs> and do it by yourself and go ahead, you know, if you think you can. And even if you fail, it, again, it doesn't really matter that much. At least you will show that you've tried, that you've tried to help. And in the end, maybe it's necessary for them to call back anyway. But at least I can't think that they would be mad at you or angry because you've tried. You've spent your time. You know, they've spent their time waiting, but at least you have tried and you've done your best. And as, as long as you do your best, most people who are polite and reasonable are not going to be angry with you if you do your best. You know, the, I think people get angry if they think, oh, that person doesn't want to help me. That person is just passing me to someone else. That person doesn't care. You know, sometimes people get a bad attitude on the phone because they think whoever they're calling is not really trying to help. But if you show that you're trying to help and that you care and that you're serious and that you're helpful, then, you know, I'm sure everything will work out eventually. It may not work out immediately, but the next, you know, if you try and it doesn't work, you can then try step two, which is they will call you back or you will call them back. But it really depends on what they're calling about. You know, each case is different. And what was the next question, Punjen? Okay, has so the next question, I think that there is the question for the many people in this session. So how to break down barrier and be able to speak English confidently. Yeah, well, this is, we've talked about that a little bit during this presentation, and I, I think it, it has to do with uh, the habit of speaking English, but I think it also has to do with what is absent in Thailand, which is, again, it's, it's a sort of Freudian term, but it has to do with the libido for English. Libido means the real excitement and um, uh, desire for English. Now, um, some people in Thailand, I know, say they like English or even love it. You know, people who are, for example, studying English at an advanced level or people who are English teachers will tell you that they love English. Um, but what we lack here, apart from the special cases, is generally uh, we do not have, maybe it's because of the colonization thing, because colonization is a terrible thing. Obviously, we all know the terrible, terrible things that happen with colonization. We see it around us in the different parts of the ASEAN community and in Asia, that colonization is a great tragedy for the people. So the Thai people were lucky not to be colonized. However, the one small, one small good thing, maybe there are a couple of small good things, but one very tiny, small good thing about being colonized is the language. And the language in, for example, you have places, well, like India, of course, where there's many wonderful Indian writers who write poetry, who write uh, novels, who write uh, nonfiction, and who write beautifully in, in Indian English and have done wonderful work. And in many other countries in Asia, they have a special English in that country where there's a great literature. That doesn't exist in Thailand. People may be right in English, but they don't. Uh, there is one uh, in terms of international acceptance now. I mean, you know, international prominence of writers. There are great scholars and people who are great researchers who are Thai people, intellectuals who have written important books in English, um, usually edited with editing help, which, you know, is normal. People, 
even native speakers of a language need editing. But um, I know there's a young man who's, I think, either in Minnesota or Wisconsin, some state in America, who is Thai from a Thai family, but who was born in America, spent a whole life in America, and now he's in his 20s and writes short stories, and they've been published in America in a book, and people like them. So that it has an international impact, but that person might as well be American. You know, he's Thai and his parents are Thai, but really it's an American young person who is writing English. Um, to find a Thai person who really has contributed to the international uh, literary uh, community, I see, Mr. Benjamin. Uh, that it requires uh, more than just this sort of desire for the language. It requires the putting in the time, making the effort. You know, and people have limited, oh, your internet connection is unstable. Does that matter? No? Everybody could hear? All right. Um, yes, sir. Stay here. It's okay. Uh, the people, you know, they might think they would like to improve their English, but do they really have the time to do it? I will give an example. Many of our students say that they love Harry Potter and they've read Harry Potter five or six times and they know Harry Potter by heart. So of course they've read it in Thai language. So I tell them, well, if you know Harry Potter by heart and you've read it six times, why don't you try to read it in English this time the next or the next time that you read it? And they go, ha, 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 ha too difficult, you know, or, or uh, one of our uh, staff, I won't say who, uh, has told me that his great idol is Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs. And of course, he the founder of Apple, co-founder of Apple. And uh, of course, the, the, the favorite book is the book by Steve Jobs about his life. So I said to this uh, person, I said, well, now that you um, have read and you know the book, uh, by Steve Jobs in Thai translation. Maybe if you read it in English, it would be good practice for you and you, you know what it's about. So you could practice your English and get good vocabulary. Uh, but I, th I don't think that person is going to read the book in English somehow. It's a big book, you know. Um, but I think showing interest in a project like that or watching uh, a series and not have Thai dubbed uh, series, watching English series, maybe even without subtitles in Thai. Because when you watch uh, subtitles, you can understand more of what's happening. But when you watch a series in English, it's a little more like being in England. Because in real life, you don't have subtitles in real life. There's no real subtitle telling you what people are saying around you. You just have to either understand or not understand. And the fact is, you will, as you see in real life, when you uh, are listening to people talking around you, if you watch a series in English, you know, with your favorite actor or actresses or whoever it is, uh, and you don't understand, it doesn't matter, my pen and I. If you're watching online, sometimes you can go back and listen to it again and see if you understand that time. You can always put on the subtitles if you want to, but if you don't understand, it doesn't matter. You just go on to the next thing. And that's how language is and how we learn by paying attention and then try to understand. If we just read the subtitles in Thai, I don't think it's a, as, as, as serious a learning process, you know, but you have to be patient and willing to try that experiment and have fun with it you know, not worry about it. Because some people worry if they don't understand, they go, oh, I didn't understand. Yeah. And I know it can be very upsetting. I remember one of John who told me, I knew his level of English was not great, you know, but he would be there at the international presentations of visiting faculty. I won't say what faculty this is. But I asked him, I said, how much do you understand when you sit there and listen to the presentations? He said, maybe 30%. So out of every 10 minutes, he understood three minutes, which is really sad because you really could get lost, you know, when most of it is lost to you and you don't understand what someone's saying. 
I know it can be very upsetting and agonizing. And, um, but part of the thing, I think the challenge is to get used to feeling a little bit lost, not worried. Like if you go swimming or if you go on a bicycle or if you go on a motorcycle, you feel a little lost maybe, but the more you do it, the more you feel a little more confidence, but it takes time. So I think you have to be willing to invest the time and spend spend the effort really to uh, to get, make things better, because if you just say, "Oh well, you know, that, that's too difficult," then then probably it won't get better. Because you really have to make an individual decision to make things better for yourself. It all becomes at some point a self help. You have to decide for yourself. No one can really do it for you. In fact. I mean, I could not teach you English, but you would teach yourself because it, ultimately it's up to you. Uh, and that's how it works, uh, in fact. Um, yeah. Any other questions? We're getting to uh, before, before we go to the next question, I'd like to share one more situation from my opinion. Yeah. Maybe you should compliment yourself, your English skills. Sometimes I believe the confidence came from the good experience too. And um, for that, uh, 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 <laughs> what's your opinion, Mr. Vitamin? Uh, you mean the person, you mean the Thai person should compliment their own English skills? Is that the point? Or then maybe just, just compliment yourself yeah sure i think everyone should have a good self-image yeah right because part of the thing about not feeling guilty and not feeling miserable about english and not worrying about english yeah just accepting yourself and feel like you say feeling a little bit bit better about yourself don't be too critical of yourself because people who have this attitude oh my english my english poor me you know it's a it's it's a negative attitude that makes things worse. To have a better attitude and have better results, people have to have a little more, little more confidence. And like you said, if you want to do that by saying, "Okay, my English isn't that bad," you know? <laughs> some people have worse. You know? So that's fine. You know, good. Why not? Anything that makes you feel better, because the more you feel better, the better you will speak English. The more comfortable you will be especially on the phone when you're speaking in the office, because that's the big ultimate challenge. Okay, Thank you, Benjamin, for, for the, the last question, I think. What, what should we do or say if the caller do not un understand our English, no matter how hard we try to pronounce or explain? Well, if they absolutely cannot understand, and you've tried saying different words, not just the same words again and again. Remember, like I said before, try to change the words so that you don't say the same thing. Maybe they'll understand you saying a different word. If they absolutely do not understand, either you can suggest you can say my, my someone else in the office will call you back uh, or um, you can again suggest email communication or or chat, you know, online communication where it's typed out. Because if if at some point you really, because like I said, you don't want to have a um, give them the impression of sort of trying so many times that it gets to be a little annoying or irritating or wasting time. After a couple of times, if they still don't under, if you still don't understand the person you're talking to. What's the point, you know? And you've tried different vocabulary and you've tried to, and maybe they will understand a different person talking to them in Thai English, or maybe uh, it's their problem and they just need to have it written down, you know? Um, so if it, I think there are solutions, but as long as people stay friendly and polite and not blaming, you know, oh, your English is terrible, you know, or giving the impression that you think the English is terrible, just sort of say, I still don't understand. Sorry, um, can I have someone else in the office call you back? And uh, I think they will be clearer, or something like that. Or I think they will be easier to understand. Uh, or would you like to, would you prefer to uh, communicate by email or by um, line or whatever it is, the type service that you use? 
uh, because then it's written and it's the pronunciation is not such an issue. But in Thailand, we don't really teach, at least I don't think, uh, we don't teach pronunciation as much as we should. And I will end now with just one other example of someone, and I won't say what faculty the person was with, or, but he was very, very, very intelligent, an excellent reading comprehension, really good English student, but his pronunciation was so bad. Uh, instead of saying library, he would say Thai English style, library, library, like that. And that was how he said it. And I tried to, you know, know library and library. And I went, I counted 50 times trying to get this very intelligent person who had excellent vocabulary skills, excellent reading comp comprehension, and was very intelligent, so should have had, you know, normally should have been able to understand phonetics and pronunciation. He could not say li library. And after 50 times, it was still libeli. So at that point, I realized well, that's just his English, you know. But with, uh, and again, it wasn't a serious issue because, you know, I, I understood what he was saying and it was not, a, you know, uh, but, but in, in a situation where there's an office phone and you're trying to help someone, um, at some point you have to accept that there's, there's a problem of communication. Ask someone else in the office, maybe who might speak a little more clearly, or at least you, you think might speak a little more clearly, or if that doesn't work, try with uh, email or uh, some other written form of chat, because uh, there are cases where the just the phonetics don't work at all, and that's you know part of it is because we don't do much phonetics here, and part of it might be in the other country where the phonetics are not great. Even in native English speaking places. Some places like Scotland, for example, the accent is sort of famous for being so difficult to understand that British people don't understand when Scottish people are, are talking sometimes, you know, it just depends. And um, in America, there's places where, you know, regional areas where the language is so difficult to understand. Kentucky, there's an accent in the state of Kentucky. That's a very difficult accent. So. You just don't know. The accents are sometimes very hard. So as long as it's polite and respectful and trying to help and not show, not seeming like you're criticizing, but as long as you try to find another solution, let me help you. How can we, how can we help? Um, let's try having someone else from my office call you back. What time would be a good time? And maybe they will be able to speak more clearly um, what about if uh, we exchange email addresses and you can write me the question by email, whatever you think would be the best, uh, and that would be a solution. As long as you do it showing that you care, I'm sure it will have a happy ending. You know. Well, thank you all for your time and for your patience. And uh, if you have any other questions, you, you're, again, you're, you're welcome to the uh, PowerPoints if you wish. You can just write and ask for them. Or if you have any other questions, you have my uh, email address here or the uh, email address of uh, anyone else at the library and just ask the question. And we're happy to help. So thank okay. you. <laughs> Okay, I believe that was all. Thank you really much, Mr. Benjamin, for being our wonderful teacher for today. And thank you to everyone for your participation today. We really hope that the information today will be useful for you. Um, for the further questions, please contact us. We are the library official line account at TU Library. And before we are part, please take a moment to fill out our certification survey so that library can improve and enhance our service. I will send this on the chat box. Okay. If you want to see what is the next topic coming, feel free to follow our Facebook page, Thamasat USD Library. I wish you all had a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sawadee ka. Let's go and make a comment. Thank you, ladies.